Welcome to another edition of The Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. Today, we've passed our one-year anniversary, and today is my 60th interview, and we now have listeners from 38 countries. So I'm thrilled today to have for my 60th interview, Roger Dooley, author of Friction. Roger, welcome. Well, thanks, Mark, and congrats on your milestone. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I can't believe it's already been a, a slightly over a year, and uh, that I've interviewed 60 fabulous authors. I've enjoyed reading all of these books. So before we talk about your book, Roger, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, we don't have time for it also. I'll do give you a, the capsule version. I graduated many years ago as an engineer, uh, got my MBA after a few years of working as an engineer, transitioned into product management. Uh, and then finally, uh, my corporate career was taking off. I was in charge of strategy for a Fortune 1000 company. And apparently like you, I bailed out of the corporate world to become an entrepreneur and have been an entrepreneur and more recently an author ever since. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been a, a really wonderful ride. I started off in the direct marketing business, so I had uh, some early exposure to quantitative marketing. Uh, that took me into digital marketing, a variety of flavors there. Uh, I built a business called College Confidential that became the busiest website for college-bound students and parents. Uh, sold that to the Daily Mail Group uh, out of the UK. Uh, and along the way, I saw the intersection of uh, two fields, neuroscience and marketing. Was, that was actually, those two fields were coming together. Uh, and I wasn't the only person to see that. Uh, there were certainly some early neuromarketing companies at the time uh, who were trying to use these to predict uh, whether ads would work or not. But I started writing about it. Uh, that led me to uh, today where I've probably created about uh, between 1,000 and 1,500 uh, blog posts and articles, uh, two books, uh, Brain Fluence and Friction, and uh, also my own podcast that I've uh, just, uh, uh, let's see, I've got that going about almost uh, six and a half years now, I think. So uh, with wow. weekly, uh, uh, that, that like you, I've had to read a lot of books and uh, it's been uh, arduous at times, but it's been an enriching experience both to uh, consume all of that knowledge uh, and then also to get a chance to talk to the authors themselves. So I uh, uh, applaud you on your journey this far, Mark. Oh, thank you. And, and you have to send me your podcast um, so I can list it in our newsletter because we list these different podcasts. And we've had quite a few people who have their own podcast listen to the show every week. So I appreciate that. So why did you write this book and why the title? It's uh, an outgrowth of my earlier my work Brainfluence, which was basically how to apply neuroscience and even more importantly, behavioral science to market better. Uh, I, when people ask me, okay, well, how do I integrate the stuff that you're teaching me with my other stuff I'd have to talk about, uh, the product features and benefits and so on, I created a little framework I called the persuasion slide uh, based on the uh, children's playground device. And uh, I won't go into all the details of that. We don't really need to do that, but I, there's a couple kinds of motivation, the customer's motivation, uh, the motivation that you're providing, which is the angle of the slide. Uh, there's the nudge, which is the push at the top, but when mom or dad gives the child a little shove. But to me, the most interesting part was friction. If you've ever seen a child get stuck partway down a slide, it's because there's too much friction. It's not slippery enough. I, and I realized that so much uh, business success depends on reduction or elimination of friction. You know, there is so much, uh, so many sales processes, whether it is lead generation or e-commerce checkout uh, that end up not being completed simply because of friction. And so I got, as I delved into it from a customer experience standpoint, uh, I saw how that affected employee experience too, uh, how uh, arduous procedures within a company, multiple layers of approval that slowed things down uh, this kind of friction was not only antithetical to company success, it demotivated the people, it made them feel untrusted. And so it ended up becoming a much broader work than I imagined initially it was going to be about uh, an effortless customer experience, uh, but it really transitioned into uh, a bigger look at how friction affects all aspects of human behavior. Uh, that is uh, friction meaning 
uh, any unnecessary effort to perform a task. That's my simplest definition. And that, that was going to be my first question. But before I get into that, and, and, and thank you for answering that, if, if there are three things you would like readers to walk away with from reading this book and so worthwhile reading, what would they be? Wow, there is so much. I think uh, I've, I've touched them on, on them a little bit. Uh, you know, I think, first of all, if you're in business, you have to take friction out of the customer experience. And I've got mass amounts of data to show not only does it affect things like conversion rate, in other words, how many sales you make, how many customers you acquire, but uh, also uh, how it affects customer loyalty and how its impact there is so huge, uh, uh, sometimes a 10 to one uh, factor in customer loyalty and word of mouth. Uh, how it, but the second thing would be how it affects your personal uh, experience. In other words, you can change your own behaviors by eliminating or adding friction. The, uh, if you look at common methods for habit formation, for uh, ceasing bad behaviors, whether it's uh, uh, eating too much ice cream or smoking, uh, you know, friction, both adding and subtracting can be used to manage these. Uh, and then finally, I mentioned employee experience. Again, if you're in a business, uh, look at what is going on around you. And when you find friction eliminated, you will create a better workplace, a more engaged team. And you know, those, uh, those three things, I think, uh, could have dramatic impact on uh, any business person's life. Yeah, I, and, and I told you in the beginning that I have a new venture and this book changed the email I'm sending for marketing to financial institutions from reading this book that so was so worthwhile. So you already defined uh, what you uh, think of as friction. I, I really enjoyed the Roman history because I like Roman history. You imparted talking about how Rome expanded in the major battle that Caesar won. Please talk about why you provide this information and what can entrepreneurs, business leaders learn from the Romans? Well, Mark, I wanted to show that this friction concept uh, wasn't just something dreamed up for digital marketers, which it seems to be. You know, if you go to Silicon Valley and talk to uh, software entrepreneurs, uh, they will all talk about friction and how their product reduces it. Uh, but um, uh, one of the early examples that I found was the expansion of the Roman Empire, which they expanded to a territory much greater than any previous uh, or perhaps even following empire. And not only that, uh, typically empires had been built around bodies of water. In other words, uh, a country uh, could dominate the Mediterranean, uh, uh, but this was typically ports because once you got inland, you were on unfamiliar territory. It was hard to get to places. Your enemies were better supplied. Uh, they had fortifications. And what the Romans did to connect this extremely far-flung empire and to get farther into uh, the territory away from simply uh, the port cities was to build roads, amazing roads. Uh, even today, some of these still stand uh, and Romans were tremendous engineers. Uh, typically, up to that point, uh, travel by road was arduous. Uh, they were dirt roads. Uh, if the weather was bad, they got muddy. Uh, you couldn't use wheeled vehicles uh, like uh, carts. Uh, you know, horses had difficulty uh, getting around. The Romans made these roads straight. They made them flat. Uh, they built bridges to avoid going down and then up. Uh, they tunneled through mountains when they had to. Uh, they did everything they could uh, to make this a frictionless path. And uh, the differences in time were phenomenal. Uh, a rider uh, could get in 24 hours what might have taken uh, weeks before of uh, foot travel or even some sort of uh, slow horse travel. Uh, it, was, it was phenomenal. And this enabled uh, Caesar, among other things, to uh, carry army and materials deep into Gaul, which is today's France. Uh, and I describe an amazing battle where they attacked a fortified city where they were outnumbered uh, and they encircled it. They built these fortifications around it to protect themselves first um, from the people inside the fort and then when they were gonna be attacked from outside from that. But the reason they were able to do this was because they had a supply chain uh, and roads uh, that went all the way back to where they could get their material, where they could quickly move men around, they could move reinforcements around. And this is just one example, but this is what enabled the Roman Empire 
uh, to thrive and grow. I, th I thought that was right. What, what did they do? They built uh, walls around and trapped the other army in inside those walls, right? Yes, they were both defensive walls, but they also trapped, or they thought they trapped the, uh, what uh, uh, made the, that particular situation more interesting was uh, the Gauls inside the fort managed to get a few riders out uh, despite the Roman uh, fortifications before the Romans had completely encircled them. Uh, they got some riders out to get reinforcements, which forced the Romans to not just defend against the tens of thousands of troops inside the fort, but against more tens of thousands of troops that were coming to reinforce them. Uh, so it was, uh, I mean, the Romans were fantastic engineers to think about uh, building uh, the inner wall was something like 11 miles in circumference. The outer wall was bigger, uh, some, uh, a couple more miles in circumference than that. So uh, just a you know, phenomenal job of construction, but it was enabled by uh, their road system, these extremely well-paved roads that could stand all kinds of traffic. Uh, and along the way too, they did, built uh, way stations where fast riders could change horses. They could rest for the night if they needed to. Uh, and they made uh, travel uh, much more modern and civilized uh, than it had been. Yeah, I remember you mentioned one of the emperors was able to get back, I think, for a funeral, 200 miles in 24 hours, which was uh, an unbelievable at that time. Yeah, it, it was revolutionary. And, you know, it's, I think you can sort of draw a parallel to today's internet, where uh, that too, I think, uh, may be considered revolutionary. Uh, you know, by, by speeding up communications, but uh, this, uh, uh, this was sort of the internet of the day. So the chapter on Amazon was interesting because they've been so good at reducing friction, a variety of separate businesses, not just, you know, selling product online. What has Amazon done well to reduce friction, create a greater connection with customers and drive profits? Can you share some examples? Yes, uh, you know, uh, Friction reduction is in Amazon's DNA. Uh, Jeff Bezos said in a presentation many years ago that when you reduce friction, when you make something easier, people do more of it. Now, that is the simplest statement I've ever seen uh, for describing Amazon's strategy. Uh, in, back in 1998, they patented one-click ordering. Uh, and, you know, a lot of companies didn't think you could do that. Uh, it was too simple, too obvious. I, I saw that at the time, said, ah, you can't patent something that simple. Well, they did. Uh, and immediately they got locked in a big battle with Barnes & Noble, their chief competitor at the time, who also implemented a similar feature on their site. Uh, and after millions of dollars in legal expense, Amazon pre prevailed. Uh, they, you know, what did they get uh, for all of that money? all of the management attention, the lawsuits, the, the time in court, all they got was one tiny little click advantage over Barnes and Noble and all of their other e-commerce competitors. It doesn't seem like one tiny little click would be worth millions of dollars, but it was to Jeff Bezos and Amazon. And not only that, uh, there was one other smart guy at the time, Steve Jobs was about to introduce Apple's new music store. He saw one click ordering they did not try and fight the patent or work around it. They paid Amazon a million dollars so they could have one tiny little click advantage over their competitors. Uh, but that isn't the only thing they did. You know, back in, oh, it was about 2008, uh, Amazon saw the customers were super frustrated with this uh, uh, packaging uh, that most stuff came retail packaging, plastics, you can't do your bare hands, use uh, scissors or knives or machetes. Uh, if you don't stab yourself with your sharp implement, you're uh, You know, I just had uh, Colin Breyer uh, from Amazon. He's no longer with Amazon now. He, he's not with Amazon now, but for two years, he was Jeff Bezos's shadow. He was a guy that followed Jeff Bezos around and acted like his chief of staff. And uh, he missed the time when I try and open, open the myself station online in a few seconds. Uh, you, they, you can take your product to a Kohl's, to a Whole Foods, to UPS, to the post office. If you destroyed your packaging, 
some of those locations will still will even pack it up for you and label it in your mobile phone and the bare product. Uh, and it's totally unheard of for mail order company to do this because this is so expensive. This costs Amazon a ton of money, but it has created unparalleled customer loyalty. Last year during the pandemic, they had to add 400,000 new employees to keep up with demand because who did people turn to first? The company they trusted to get their product to them reliably. And that was Amazon. I tell you, Amazon has obviously changed the world in ways that nobody could have foresaw. You have a good example of a failed experience with Staples. Uh, please talk about that and what they could have done better along with what we all can learn from this. Well, this is a kind of an uh, antique example, but uh, it's important because Staples invented the easy button. Remember, remember those uh, red easy buttons that they would uh, uh, actually sell in their store, people put them on their desks uh, uh, because they were so easy to deal with. Well, uh, I needed some ink for my printer and I knew that Staples would deliver it to me the next day for free because I was a Staples customer. That's even faster than Amazon would at the time, at least. Amazon was two days. So I jumped on staples.com, dropped the product in my cart, went to check out, and what did I find? Uh, this horrendously long order form. Uh, there were probably 25 different fields in it, little gray areas of fine print. Uh, and despite the fact that I was an existing customer, of Staples, it didn't remember my login information that would have filled in some of this information, uh, nor for some reason did my browser remember my login uh, the way it does for most sites. Was this because Staples designed the form that way? I don't know. Uh, but at that point I was faced with a dilemma. Do I try and locate my login information, which no guarantee of success, it would undoubtedly be high effort to do that. Um, do I go through their uh, login uh, renewal process? Do I try and create a new password uh, with their verification system, which always takes more time than you think it should. Plus then I'd have to change my login if any of my other devices did remember it. Or do I check out using that form, check out as a guest? Well, I didn't do any of those things. I just jumped in my car, went to Office Max and 30 minutes later, I was back in my office. The ink was in my printer and my Staples ink was still in that shopping cart, part of four plus trillion dollars of merchandise abandoned annually in e-commerce shopping carts. Uh, that's more than twice the actual uh, amount of sales in e-commerce, massive quantities of abandoned merchandise. And why does that stuff get abandoned? There are a lot of reasons, uh, but when one company looked at this, they researched why do people abandon their shopping carts? Of the top five reasons, uh, about four were friction. They were a complicated checkout process. The need to set up an account to check out as opposed to checking out as a guest. Uh, surprises at the end, like extra costs or for, uh, processes. Uh, you know, all of these things uh, add friction and they cause people to say, nope, I'm not gonna complete this. The numbers of people who fail to complete that process are just staggering. And it's not just true for e-commerce, it's true for even for things like account signups uh, for lead generation or for signing up for some kind of a service. If it's too complicated, people won't do it. Yeah, I, you know, I had wondered about that because I had marked that down about the 4.6 trillion. I mean, that's an incredible number. And I wonder how, how much of that is attributed just to people changing their mind for finding a better price. Because I've done that. I've been on Facebook. I saw an ad. I thought I'd want to buy the product. And just as I was going to do, I said, yeah, I better go to Google and Google it or go to Amazon and see if there's a lower price. And oftentimes I'd find a lower price on Amazon for exactly the same product over there. And that's why I would abandon uh, my shopping right. cart and go on. Right. Well, certainly that is one of the reasons that people do that. Sometimes uh, they do it to see what the price is going to be uh, because they can't tell. In other words, uh, the shipping, co the cost of shipping isn't obvious until you put the product in your cart uh, and look at it. Sometimes you can't even tell what the price of the product is until you put it in the cart. It says, you know, uh, view price in cart. Uh, and that's sort of a self-inflicted uh, wound, I think, for those companies. Uh, but uh, the, this research was done, I forget the name of the company that did it, uh, that showed that many of the top reasons were 
uh, these sort of just unnecessary effort or difficulty or uh, negative surprises at the end. Uh, do you know how successful Alexa has been in receiving orders? Because it's always asking me to put orders. I actually have an Alexa in at every room. Uh, and I like using it to ask questions too, especially when I'm watching TV, but I haven't bought anything uh, using Alexa. And so I'm wondering how, how, how powerful has this been in terms of creating the shopping experience and being part of that one button uh, process of closing a sale? Yeah, we've probably triggered everybody's Alexa devices now. Uh, fortunately, I'm not in a room with one. Uh, uh, I have uh, brand G in this particular room, <laughs> but uh, I do have a couple of Alexas in different parts of the house. I have not used them for shopping. Uh, I do think uh, uh, that this is a nascent area for them. I'm sure more and more people are doing it. Uh, I don't know what percentage of sales are made that way now, uh, but for things like repeat orders, for stuff that I know that I get there, uh, that'd be a very simple task uh, because there are any number of products that I do buy from Amazon on a regular basis. Maybe I don't want to set them up on a su subscription because my usage is not quite that predictable. But if I see I'm getting low, it would be great to uh, uh, tell that uh, woman on the counter to say, hey, just uh, order this again for me. Now, for a full shopping experience, probably not so much where you want to compare prices or product features or other things. But for reordering, I can see, oh, yeah. I have to say the Amazon thing is great. I'm running out of dog food. I'm walking to the car and boom, I, uh, I type that in and, and it pulls it right up right away. Uh, right. For, well, they tried their dash button, Mark, uh, uh, those little automated buttons yes. that were about as frictionless as you could get. You can imagine putting one of those in your dog food cover, cupboard uh, that will, you know, just push it and it'll automatically order. Uh, but clearly that doesn't scale for a large number of products. You know, you're probably not going to have 47 dash buttons in your cupboard. So, uh, it, but it's an interesting thought experiment. And I think that they did it just to see how well it would work and to get people in the habit of that instant reorder method. But I'm sure that they saw voice ordering as being one way of doing that uh, without having a plethora of little devices stay, you know, sticking around your house. I thought the Kindle was brilliant. I mean, I'm an early adapter to Kindle. And I thought, how great is this that when I'm traveling, because I've traveled a lot, was traveling a lot, and I'd always carry three books with me in my backpack. And now I have like 100 books in my Kindle that I take. But one time I was flying out and I'm sitting on the, as the engines are starting, a ready to take off and I figure, I need one more book. I'm worried. I'm going to Italy. And at that time, you just couldn't zap them down from Italy. And so I ordered a bestseller within 60 seconds. And I think that's the frictionless that you're really talking about here, right? Absolutely. And they, they did some uh, interesting things when they were developing the Kindle 2 to uh, create uh, reduce friction in ordering, where before uh, other devices, you had to uh, sideload stuff. Like you might have to connect your device to a computer to download it. Uh, where part of Amazon's strategy was to make it super easy to do that. Now it's pretty much, uh, you know, everybody does that. You can download them on your phone or any other, your tablet. But in the pre-iPad days, uh, it was not easy to download stuff. Uh, and they made it so simple. And of course, to transport stuff around, I used to travel. And if I was on a, going on a lengthy trip, 10% uh, of my suitcase weight would be in books. Yeah, but, same uh, yeah. yeah uh, no longer. Yeah, my back is feeling much better from that. What, what role is AI playing making the sales and customer service more frictionless? I think AI, uh, particularly if it's relatively invisible, just simply uh, makes it easier because you're seeing what you want to see. Uh, you know, if you have to uh, go through a selection process uh, or a menuing process to get where you want, uh, that's more friction. Uh, if an AI process, whether it's at Amazon or any place else, is anticipating your need and you're seeing it right in front of you, uh, then, hey, uh, you're more likely to do that. You know, if you log on to Netflix, chances are they're going to present stuff uh, that is going to get you to watch something as opposed to randomly presenting whatever some other people are watching right then. Uh, now, they may give you a most popular option, too, if you wanted some social proof, but... Uh, you know, 
just about every major brand and minor ones too are using AI to make uh, dealing with them easier, requiring less effort, fewer clicks, uh, you know, fewer screens to view and so on. Uh, what's your take on using drones and where will they add the greatest value? Well, you know, I would, I think I'm gonna uh, say, I'm not sure yet. I do like the concept of drone delivery where you place an order and within you know, minutes, your order has been picked and a little robot flying craft is taking off from the warehouse and going to your residence and dropping it in your driveway or on your little drone landing pad maybe. Uh, but yeah, I think we're a little ways off from that. Uh, but I think that would be a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, beyond that, I think that uh, drones for uh, human transport have some real potential. Uh, again, as sort of a, a robo flying taxi. And there's, there's experimentation going on with this right now. It isn't clear the economics favor that, uh, but uh, we could be getting there as we get, you know, really high density batteries for short range uh, electrical uh, vehicles. You know, you're, you're never going to see, um, I don't think, not, not in our uh, generation or lifetime, uh, uh, transatlantic flights that are all electric, uh, but uh, certainly for close in uh, drone flights, I think that's quite realistic. I'm waiting for the Star Trek version where it's beam me up Scotty and I can go to Europe using that. That would be real frictionless. Yeah, that, that would be good. And uh, uh, science fiction is a little ahead of reality there, but it'd certainly be nice to be able to do that. Yeah, and I, and I think the drones are like a hitman and drug dealers the panacea because they can go in and deliver whatever they're doing so quickly and easily. But what do you think of Amazon creating supermarkets with no cashiers and do you see it being successful? Yes, I do. I think that uh, whether you know it's Amazon's implementation in their Go stores, which are still in the experimental phase or some of their other uh, concepts, you know, I'm not sure what's going to win, but the idea of being able to uh, pick a product off a shelf and check out of the store without checking out at all, just by walking out. You know, I think this is definitely going to happen. You know, the technology is still uh, in its early stages. Uh, Amazon is doing, a, I think, a pretty good job of it in its Go stores, but it's not yet uh, a prime time. They were predicting that uh, by this year, they'd have a couple thousand stores. Uh, don't really have that yet. But I think there is uh, definitely a potential. We see it not just with Amazon, Alibaba has had their Imas stores in China uh, that use some of that same kind of technology that makes purchases frictionless, where you can uh, buy by facial recognition without uh, credit cards or even your mobile device. Uh, it's, um, you know, so I think that this high level of automation uh, is definitely with us. We see it in, in other places, a little bit different implementation, but when you visit Walt Disney World, their magic band is helping you along all the way. Your restaurant purchases are more automated. Uh, your greetings are automated. Your photos are automated. Uh, and in a somewhat similar vein, but with uh, different benefits, when you board some cruise ships now, like the uh, medallions ships that are typically on Princess uh, line, which is a carnival brand, uh, they have that same kind of magic band level automation where you can walk in and out of your room uh, cabin, if you prefer, without uh, hands-free. And well, I'll, I'll read one little story about that. Uh, I had a chance sure. to talk to John Paget, who was the lead on the Magic Band team at Disney and then went to Carnival Cruises to enhance their customer experience. And when they were selling this concept to executives, and you, you gotta imagine, Mark, this is a difficult sell for uh, executives where they are being asked to invest maybe, uh, in the case of the Magic Band system, it was a billion dollars in infrastructure that is basically invisible to the customer, okay? A billion dollars would probably buy you two new Star Wars rides. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, it's a huge, huge variation uh, or, you know, expense without necessarily an obvious customer benefit. But uh, what it did was it greatly enhanced the experience. But to get back to uh, my story, uh, when Paget was uh, at Carnival, he presented this 
And they said, do we really have to change out all the locks? Because you can imagine retrofitting all the electronic locks on a cruise ship, a pretty expensive thing because they've already got these little key card locks that you just simply slide in. Uh, they're quite easy to do. Uh, they're about, about as frictionless as you can get uh, while still having physical contact. And uh, he convinced them or the team convinced them that yes, we had to do this. When guests were queried after the inaugural cruises, what did they mention most often was this improbable thing of being able to get into your room uh, without having to slide the card in and out. Why? And this was not necessarily the most obvious use case, but on a cruise ship, you often have somebody coming back to their room with maybe a cup of coffee and breakfast. Maybe they brought something back for the, uh, their partner who's uh, still in the room asleep. Uh, and you're standing there in the hallway with your hands full and you've got to get that card out to put it in. Uh, and either you put your food on that, no doubt very sanitary hallway carpeting. Yeah. Uh, you know, or, but with this, you can just get it, approach the door, elbow it open, uh, and you're inside. That was the most memorable thing, but it wasn't obvious. And it was only when this capability was in there that people recognized, wow, this is a big benefit. Yeah, I, uh, and that's a great example. You write about Alibaba, and you just mentioned that, which mostly serves Asia and in particular China. There, they are as powerful as Amazon. How are they different and what are some of the unique offerings they have that make the customer experience better? Well, they have uh, they are very different than Amazon and the Chinese market where they are strongest is very different. And I, uh, the, what, but one of their experimental efforts, as I mentioned briefly, is their EMA stores. That's H-E-M-A, which is not to be confused with the similar brand and that you may find in Holland. I got so excited when I landed at uh, Amsterdam, Amsterdam Schiphol Airport on my last international trip before things shut down uh, to find a, a mass store, I thought, right in the airport. And I thought, I'm going to be able to see this in action. And it turned out, no, no, that's we're, we're not the Chinese one. <laughs> we're the <laughs> European Dutch one. Uh, but uh, these stores have very high levels of automation. Uh, you can select uh, seafood items from their store, you can select a live lobster uh, and they will cook it and deliver it to your table robotically uh, in their restaurant area. Uh, as I mentioned, they can check you out with your face. You can uh, do basically many of these common functions uh, in a very highly automated way. Uh, plus they are multi-purpose. Uh, they are a retail store. Uh, they are a dining environment. They are also a delivery location where they can deliver their products to customers who don't want to leave their house, their apartment. Uh, plus they are a pickup center for shipments or they can be a fulfillment center for shipments. Uh, and they combine all this and this elimination of friction that making things easier for their customers regardless of how the customer wants to interface with them. They wanna to go to the store and do something. If they wanna do something uh, have the store bring it to them, whatever. Uh, this has increased the value of housing in uh, the delivery radius of these EMA stores. Uh, it's pretty amazing, but uh, they're actually having an impact on real estate prices where they are because they are a desirable amenity. Yeah, what are some of the really cool things that Alibaba has instituted that we're not aware of here, do you know? I guess I'm, you know, not quite as familiar with the brand, but, uh, you know, to me, they have taken a tech first approach. Uh, they have also made uh, getting customer feedback easier. You know, Amazon was a pioneer with customer reviews. Many of their suppliers, particularly the book suppliers, hated the idea of unfiltered customer reviews. They wonder what if people don't like the book? That's going to hurt sales. Uh, they couldn't get it. Past, they, they couldn't get past the idea that you know people might say bad things. That's going to hurt our sales. They didn't realize that unfiltered feedback was far more trustworthy than somebody's blurb on the cover of a book, even if that person is an expert. Uh, if you know you have five thousand people reviewing a book, and four hundred are saying it's really good, uh, that's more persuasive. Uh, than a famous author, uh, Stephen King, saying, hey, this is a good book. Um, even if there are bad reviews, 
you know, that adds credibility. Uh, but, you know, a lot of cases, you don't have those reviews. You go to Amazon, it's a new product. Uh, maybe they don't have many. Uh, Alibaba made it very easy with a community approach to get uh, nearly instantaneous feedback. You're in a store, you're looking at a product. You can actually ask people, hey, what do you think about this product? And within 10 minutes, you may get a live response from somebody who has bought that product telling you what they liked or didn't like about it. So, you know, they've, uh, they've really taken a tech first approach, uh, not in a way that mirrors Amazon, but in some cases in a way that differs from Amazon because it's a very social, uh, shopping is a social activity there. People share what they're buying. Uh, they've got uh, influencers are popular around the world, of course, uh, but there I think influencers play an outsized role uh, in decisions and just about anybody can become an influencer if they happen to you know, strike the right chord with people who are watching them. I, I think you're right about it. We always look at what other uh, customers are saying, good or bad. And we still might, even if we read some bad reviews, we still might go to that restaurant or to wherever and, and still do that. One of the questions we have from the audience is, are there any good B2B examples of companies who've been very good at creating this frictionless? I guess Dell was when they used to, be, when you used to buy the computer that you can buy it exactly the way you wanted it and, and get it shipped in very short order. Yes, you know, I think that all office uh, general applying behavioral science is something that only works in the B2C world uh, that, because consumers make uh, irrational decisions where B2B customers are totally rational. Well, uh, the uh, revelation is that B2B customers are humans, first of all. Uh, they operate under the same cognitive biases uh, and unconscious influences that consumers do. Clearly in the B2B world, those important product features and characteristics uh, are, uh, they play an important, very important role. The product has to do the job for which it's intended. If you're selling industrial machinery, it's got to do the job. Uh, if not, then it's a failed sale uh, and that's bad for everybody. But once you get past that point, uh, you know, what impact is this going to have on the buyer's prestige in the company? Uh, if it's a success, uh, will they maybe get a promotion? If it's a failure, will they get fired or demoted or at least get a black mark? You know, what are the, will this, uh, can this purchase shut down production if it goes wrong? You know, all of these things uh, aren't necessarily conscious in the mind of the buyer, but they're affecting that buying decision. And, uh, you know, I think that you described one good example, uh, Dell, which uh, they made ordering products easy. You know, for years, uh, you would sit down with maybe a human consultant to design your system. Uh, and for years, this is not a brand new innovation. Uh, there have been things called configurators uh, that enabled a customer to configure their product in a way that was best suited to their needs. Uh, and of course, as uh, technology has progressed, these things have gotten smarter and smar smarter. Uh, now they may incorporate AI. Uh, Dell actually has an AI system that um, uh, I found was pretty good at answering questions. In other words, I uh, was trying to find out about the characteristics of a product I was considering buying. And right now I am connected on a Dell, by the way. The, uh, and I wanted to find out something, I think it was just how much the uh, product weighed or something, something relatively obvious, but I couldn't find it in, on the website easily for whatever reason. And so I went in, I said, I'll just jump on a chat. Well, I didn't get a chat human, I got a chat bot. And instantly uh, this chat bot found the exact piece of information I was looking for. It might've been something a bit more complex in the way to the product. There's some characters of the product. And I was very impressed that, wow, this was better than dealing with a human because I got the exact correct answer uh, instantly. And you know, this is a lot like, I think, uh, dealing with checking out at a supermarket. Most supermarkets today uh, and other types of retail businesses, I have an automated checkout line or a group of checkout lines that are automated. And uh, there are times when that is a good solution for the customer. Uh, if I've got one item that clear, is clearly barcoded, I will avoid the human line and go straight for that available automated line because I know I can scan it uh, and be on my way in you know, 15 seconds or less without uh, you know, even any interaction. Not that I dislike interacting with humans, but it's just faster. Uh, on the other hand, 
if I've got a cart full of stuff that's complicated, it's maybe something, some things don't have barcodes, uh, there are things that have to be weighed. I don't want to go through automated checkout. That's too much effort. I want somebody to do that for me. Uh, and smart companies give you those options. You know, they don't push you into voice menus uh, where you have to listen to nine choices, then pick one and listen to eight more choices and then pick one of those. I mean, that's, that's high friction. At that point, it's much easier to talk to a human. But if you can deliver something over a voice menu with just one click and get to exactly what the customer wants, then that's a good thing. So to me, these, you know, in, whether it's B2B or B2C, you know, focus on how can we make this process easier, whether it's learning about the product, whether it's getting, uh, whether it's placing an order, whether it's expediting an order, make it easy. You know, give people the easy access to what they want and they'll do more of it. I used to like orbits a lot and now I won't, I just won't buy my plane ticket. I'd rather pay a little more, go directly to the airline. And that's because the customer service is so horrible because you have to go through these decision trees and there's no human being on the other end where they used to have a human on the other end that you could call if you were had a, a question that couldn't be answered online. And now it's just, it, it's too painful and takes way too much time. One of the questions that's being asked here is how effective is offering free shipping with business incurring margin reduction? Oh. Free shipping uh, is interesting. This is uh, a proven tenet of behavioral science uh, that uh, when you offer free shipping, uh, you will sell more stuff if you normally charge for shipping. Uh, the problem is it tends to be expensive to offer free shipping. And this is a dilemma that Amazon faced. They knew uh, that if they could eliminate shipping, they would sell a lot more stuff, but it costs money to ship. And if you you know, you can build shipping uh, into your cost, into your price that you charge customers, but then your price is higher. And you run that risk of people doing comparison shopping, just as you see on these comparison sites where you'll see a come on low price, hey, this looks like the lowest price. And then you find out, well, yeah, but you've got to add this other thing in there to see what the real price is. Uh, so today, a lot of those comparison sites will force companies to include shipping in uh, the price they ex expose customers to. But free shipping from behavioral science works. Dan, Dan Ariely, a well-known researcher and author, uh, has shown that the word free has an outsized effect on our brains beyond whatever the value of the free thing is. Uh, so free shipping works. What Amazon's solution for that was, was to offer Prime, where people join this uh, program, uh, a recurring program that gives them a variety of benefits including free shipping. And, but even early on, Amazon was working harder and harder to do, to do free shipping. First, it was on orders over one value. Then they reduced that value uh, to a lower value. And a lot of companies still do that. They give you free shipping if you buy more than $49 or $29 or something. Uh, but that still is not good as just having blanket free shipping. But they have not come up with their own answer for Prime yet. And you know, Prime is uh, an amazing tool for Amazon. Uh, because it has enabled them to sell more. Amazon, I mentioned Colin Breyer, he talked to me about their flywheel uh, in our chat uh, and how Amazon has this sort of flywheel effect where you sell more, uh, you, that enables you to offer better deals to customers and you sell more. And along the way, you're eliminating friction in that process. You're making that flywheel spin faster and faster by making it easier by reducing delivery times. Uh, and so, you know, Amazon Prime now uh, as and probably all are, are you a member, Mark? I'm guessing the answer would be yes. I am. I love it. Yes, yeah. of course. I'm, I'm probably 90% of the people watching this, at least those in the U.S. are. Uh, and what they've done is uh, they've made it, uh, turned it into a true loyalty program, not just uh, a gamified loyalty program. Like I've uh, been one can United, uh, not so much uh, lately. I haven't flown in a year, uh, but I was extremely loyal to United but it was transactional. Uh, I had such great status with them that I got all these amazing benefits. Uh, but if there was no love for United there, uh, if Delta called me up and said, Roger, we'll do everything they do for you and more if you just switch to us, I would say, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll try that. Uh, but Amazon uh, has true loyalty, unconscious loyalty. Here in Texas, uh, a few years ago, 
they increased, well, my Amazon prices increased by 8% because they began charging sales tax. They were one of the first online e-commerce companies to do this, uh, other than the big, like Walmarts that had physical presence here. I said, Roger, you're going to shop around more because it'd be stupid to pay Amazon 8%. Uh, when I look back a year later, my behavior had changed, not at all. I was too loyal uh, because they have taught me, uh, A, I've got free shipping, B, they'll deliver to me very, very quickly, same day, next day, or 48 hours in almost every case. Uh, and they are incredibly reliable. Uh, this has taught me uh, that I keep doing business with Amazon. Gartner, the big market research company, did some amazing work on customer loyalty. And they showed that the most important driver of customer loyalty uh, was eliminating friction what they called an effortless experience. When customers had a high effort experience, they were way more likely to shop around. Um, like 90% said they would shop around. That's 10 times as high uh, as the number that had a low effort experience. Uh, and the scary thing was, perhaps most scary for brands, for those customers who had a high effort experience, 88% said they would say bad things about the brand compared to just 1% of the low effort customers. Uh, so anytime you can reduce effort for your customers, whether they're B2C, B2C, you are building true loyalty. No, no question about it. Another question we have here is any research that shows if not asking for a credit card for subscription free trials pans out for the company? Well, I, whether it pans out for the company I would say it depends because uh, it depends on your business model. Uh, a freemium model where if your trial is, you know, if you, you offer people a free trial, whatever the product is, whether it is a magazine subscription or whether it is a uh, software product, software as a service product, uh, this has been shown to be a very effective model for getting people to sign up. Uh, but people do it different ways. Uh, some, like Evernote, your freemium subscription is good forever, okay? Uh, you can keep using their product and a large number of their, large percentage of the customers keep using the free product forever. Uh, that was true for Dropbox too, uh, where- Or what's that? Storage at a certain point, uh, they're, they were totally free, no credit card required, no nothing you would only need to give them a credit card if you said, okay, now I want to store more stuff. True for both Evernote and Dropbox. Um, so that's, that's one model. Uh, and it's, both companies have been very successful. There are other companies that may offer a free subscription uh, and their business model is to uh, make it easy for you to continue that subscription uh, without doing anything. So they get your credit card and they auto renew you. And again, that's true for software companies. It's true for publications. Uh, they will get fewer signups to begin with, for sure. Uh, because as soon as you throw in that barrier of a credit card, and then not, beyond just the effort of providing that, there is the question of trust. Do I trust this brand with my information? And there's a question, yeah, I don't really intend to continue this. Am I going to remember or am I going to suddenly find oh, darn, I've been charged uh, for a whole year and I'm going to have to argue with them about it or it's going to be effortful. So uh, that is a barrier. Uh, but it really depends on the business model. Uh, and the only thing I don't recommend doing is a, what I call, no, I don't call that, this is a, an industry term, uh, a dark pattern business model where you get people's credit card and tell them, uh, you know, there's no obligation, you can unsubscribe whenever you want, but you make it very difficult to unsubscribe. Uh, and there is a major business publication whose initials are WSJ, <laughs> who employs uh, this model, uh, where they give you these great free, uh, trial offers. They're not free trials, but they are very low cost trial offers. Uh, you know, for a dollar or for $5 or something, you get a, a long subscription. Uh, but when you go to unsubscribe, uh, you see, you log into your account, you see that auto renew is turned on and you try and click on auto renew to turn off, you can't. Uh, instead you click on a link and there's this big text box that shows, tells you how to 
turn off auto renew, which involves calling into their customer service line, which they do not provide in that customer, in that explanation. You have to find it elsewhere on their website. Then you dial into that number, you go into queue, you talk to a human, that human says, no, uh, sorry, I cannot do that for you. You need to talk to another human. Uh, they put you in another queue. You talk to another human who strenuously convinces you that you should not turn off auto renew. Finally, if you persist, they will do it. Uh, now to me, uh, all of this added effort, all this friction is designed to get people to not unsubscribe because you have to do that during business hours too, or during their business hours. Uh, you can't do it you know, at 2 a.m. on Saturday uh, when you might happen to be online and remember, oh, I gotta unsubscribe. Uh, I think they count on people either forgetting or just saying, oh boy, uh, this is uh, too much effort. You know, I'm kind of getting some value out of this. I'll do it for another month or two and then maybe unsubscribe. Well, they, uh, you have this gap, Roger, that you can do between one o'clock and 105 on leap years. And if you can't <laughs> manage to mark that on your calendar and get that in that five minute span, then you've missed the opportunity. Here's another question. Has Amazon customer loyalty changed due to their political affiliation with the Democratic Party? We only have about seven minutes to go for a few more questions. So what's your answer about that? Has it, have they been affected? You know, it's, uh, it's hard to say you know, how politics have affected Amazon. I'm not sure that the vast majority of people see them as an Amazon link company. Uh, Jeff Bezos did invest uh, uh, in the Washington Post, which is uh, seen as left-leaning rather than right-leaning, but uh, he's now stepped away from the company a little bit. Uh, the, uh, on the left-leaning side of things, they are seen as a foe of unions which uh, may endear them to right-leaning folks. Uh, to me, that is the, actually the bigger risk to Amazon. Uh, not so much that Amazon is directly engaging in politics, uh, but they are extremely customer-centric. You know, this is why they have had such tremendous loyalty. They put the customer at the absolute center of their business, and you will not find any time when they don't do that. They aren't one of these companies that says, yeah, we're customer-centric, and then they do things like I just described. Uh, they actually do things uh, that are focused on the customer. But in some cases, this is not necessarily great for their people. You know, they expect their people to work really hard. They expect a very high productivity so they can deliver their customers great prices and great services. Uh, and this has created a little bit of labor friction with them, where they're seen as maybe uh, being the best customer experience, but not the best or even an excellent employee experience. Now, they would argue and say that, uh, you know, their uh, employee benefits, their pay goes way beyond what most companies do, which is true. But I think that to me, that is the little more sensitive political issue that they have to deal with and be sure that they're seen as not just customer centric, but also truly employee centric. This has become like the Amazon show. Here's the ne next question uh, that we have here. Uh, many people find Amazon great, and many also find it an easy place to buy low-quality, soulless products with no stories. Uh, with storytelling is getting a huge part of branding. Uh, what is Amazon's brand in 2021? Well, I think Amazon's, I don't know that Amazon has a brand beyond, uh, we are the people that you can trust absolutely uh, to deliver you the most of the best stuff. You know, I think that uh, they have gone for the uh, everything store approach from their very first days so that you know that if you're looking for something, the first place you're going to look is at Amazon. Now, the majority of product searches no longer originate at Google as they used to, but at, at Amazon. Yeah, I know. So they, they've, they've done uh, that with their brand, uh, and they have continued to build customer trust by uh, maintaining uh, near absolute delivery reliability. When the pandemic hit, their business was in an upset condition. And I even wrote an article at Forbes that said, this could be a window of opportunity for other companies uh, to steal a little bit of Amazon's business because uh, Amazon could no longer deliver in 48 hours or less. Some products they were pushing out to week long or multi week long delivery cycles. And to me, this created vulnerability for them. Uh, because I relied on them. If I needed a product in 48 hours, I could get it there. Suddenly, uh, for stuff that I needed for my business, I could not get for three or four weeks. Now shopping around, but I think what happened was other companies were more affected by the pandemic and 
they couldn't deliver and capitalize on this momentary lapse. And within a month or two, well, you could see very quickly Amazon lead times coming back down. Uh, and within a couple of months, they were entirely back to normal across all their products. So we only have about um, three minutes left here. So I'm, I'm wondering this, and maybe this is the last question we can uh, get in. What industries are ripe for disruption and improving the overall customer experience? Well, to me, the uh, industries that have the worst customer experience today are the uh, cable companies, cable TV companies, satellite TV companies, and internet service providers, uh, and sometimes wireless providers. There's a big overlap uh, between all of those brands. Many of them participate in multiple markets, and they've all had this dark pattern approach to customer experience where they sign you up with special deals uh, and then hit you with extra fees, extra charges, and prices that go up without telling you, uh, even continuing to charge you for things that they shouldn't be charging you for. Uh, you know, if they were charging you for uh, a service that is now included in your package, in one case, uh, I was talking to a reporter for some big uh, daily, either journal or Times or somebody who said she did not get that taken off her bill until she called them on it. And I've seen the same thing. Uh, I was uh, signed up for a higher speed internet service. When I checked a year later, I was doing some testing. I found I wasn't really getting the service I was paying for. Uh, I had a horrible experience with their online chat where that's another story entirely. It took me like 30 minutes to get through uh, to even find out what I was paying for, which is crazy. When I found out, I found I was paying for twice as much, but ultimately that the modem that was their modem that they, they were billing me for every month was not capable of delivering that service. Did they tell me, say, hey, Roger, we noticed you sign up for this new service. We need to get you new equipment. No, they were happy to leave that obsolete piece of equipment there until I complained. When I complained, they said, oh, yeah, we'll change that out. To me, this is not something that Amazon would do. It's not something that Google would do. You know, and we see these industries as being initially now somewhat disrupted. Uh, I now am a Google Fi subscriber for my mobile service. One simple price, no weird charges. Uh, my digital bandwidth works anywhere in the world for 10 bucks a month, anywhere. I, the only place I found it didn't work was in Lebanon and a couple of years ago in Vietnam. For all I know, they now have service in those two places as well. Uh, you know, where with the legacy providers, uh, they were constantly offering deals. They wouldn't give you the lowest price automatically. You'd have to sign up if you want, we're gonna travel internationally. Uh, just crazy stuff. Uh, I think that these industries are all going to be disrupted as, as we get new carriers in, as 5G takes hold, and also in some cases, other 5G providers, but uh, I do think, and then we've got these satellite companies coming in, uh, Elon Musk and others. Uh, I think uh, they're going to be in for a world of hurt if they try and employ these same business models. I agree with you totally. Well, Roger, thank you so much for taking the time uh, with us today. Love the book. Definitely worth reading. And you can tell by the number of questions we had, people really enjoyed listening to you today. I hope everybody has a, a safe weekend. I want to thank everybody for allowing me to do this 60th show and from all the people around the world who keep turning, tuning in and listening uh, to these conversations. Have well, a thank great you, Mark. Thank you so much. Enjoy well, your weekend, you, everybody. Stay a, safe. Good, a, a, great, uh, a great conversation and some great questions, not just from you, but from uh, the folks in attendance as well. So I hope everybody has a uh, fun and safe weekend. Same. Take care.